Let's talk about the strongest and weakest scions of the noble households with a tier list of Imperial Knights units in Warhammer 40k 10th edition. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics where today we're talking knights once more and in this video I thought we'd go through the entirety of Index Imperial Knights and the Forge World Imperial Armour Index and talk about which patterns are most commonly finding their way into competitive lists and which are doing well for the great households of Warhammer 40k. Out of the gate in 10th edition Imperial Knights have been doing rather well, one of the strongest factions in the game right now with an entire army worth of very tough, very deadly walkers. They do seem to be far outpacing their Chaos Brothers on the tournament tables at the moment, perhaps partly just due to a whole load of raw damage and defence given by their faction rules, rather than messing around with battle shock and things. In 40k 10th edition they definitely have a lot of advantages, certainly on the edition's release they were kind of oppressive with the sheer amount of towering firepower that they can bring for the points, but they still seem to be certainly on the upper end of things despite Games Workshop increasing a whole bunch of Knight's points costs. Currently I'd rate them maybe around 3rd or 4th faction strongest in the game, behind Eldari and Genestealer Cult, at least until Games Workshop make any changes. In any case, in this video I thought we'd talk through which units are most commonly being run in competitive lists with success, which ones are rated as strongest and which ones as weakest out of the Index and the Imperial Armour, and go through every single nightly datasheet available to us, and the pros and cons of each. With that in mind, I've ranked them into 4 rough tiers, obviously always a little bit arbitrary depending on what your arm is building around, and what your playstyle tends to be with the knights, but just a rough gauge of their power level, both based on my opinion, a recent channel poll, and what's been run to some success in competitive lists. In general most of the patterns do seem at least fairly playable though, knights are definitely in a good spot. Before we jump into the tier list itself, I thought I'd just quickly mention the knight household giveaway that I'm going to be doing for September here on the channel. If you would like to land yourself some imperial knight reinforcements, I'll just mention that quickly now. The giveaway is going to be announced on the 4th of September in the channel update, and the prize will be for three different people to each win a custom knightly household made up of any three of their choices of Games Workshop's bigger plastic knights. Say for example you could have the new Lancer, a Dominus, and a Questorus or Abhorrent class. You can choose any of the Chaos Knights as well, and any single big knight can be swapped out for either four Armagers or War Dogs. Should hopefully be a good way to start a faction completely anew for people entering the army. If you would like to enter for that one, there's two equal ways to enter, both linked in the video description. You can either support the channel's Patreon page for any amount whatsoever, it is what allows me to keep on making these videos really quite so regularly, or you can support on social media completely for free. To do that, subscribe to the YouTube channel, like the Facebook page, and then actually enter the giveaway on a post that appears on the 1st of September UK time, and reply to that post with any photo of any 40k mini or imagery, along with your name and the date handwritten within the same photo last bit just to deter Facebook bots and spammers and make sure the prizes go to a real person. Then I put all the entries together, both the Patreon supporters and anyone entering on that Facebook post, put them all into a random number generator and pick out the three winners. That will be announced on the channel update video on YouTube around about the 4th of the month, so the 4th of September 2023. Then I'll get in touch with you guys who have won, order in the minis and post them out to you after I receive them. Feel free to check out the Patreon page or the Facebook link down in the video description and there are further giveaways every month. Getting back to the subject in hand though, and starting out we've got tier 4, the knights that are probably ranked weakest at the moment, or at least most outclassed by other choices in my opinion right now. Here I've chosen to rank the Serastus Knight Acheron for 445 points, and also the Knight Preceptor. The Knight Acheron does get the bigger and badder Serastus chassis, so it is a bit tougher and a bit faster, both of which are good, and it's got the same melee as most of the other Questorus patterns. Beyond that though, I just really don't think it's got a lot to sell it. Its main gun is a 2d6 shot flamer at strength 8, AP 1 and damage 2, which definitely will take a chunk out of infantry, but I think that that just really doesn't stand up to the other massive knightly weapons that you can get, like the Castigator's Gatling Cannon, or even most of the standard Questorus armaments. Even against fairly ideal targets, it only kills around about 3 Space Marines, or around 5 Tyranid Termagants. On top of that it backs it up with a melee phase battle shock ability which I probably rate as to one of the worst bondsman abilities out there. It does maybe redeem itself a little bit by stripping cover for something that's targeted by the big flame cannon. That is definitely relevant in 10th edition with cover saves being that big but it's just never going to be efficient for that role given that the thing costs 445 points and also requires you to fire your primary weapon at that target. Overall just a bit underwhelming really and perhaps a bit surprised that flamer doesn't have a bit more bite. I feel like 3d6 like the Knight Valiant would have put it in a better place. 
Otherwise, the knight that I think is severely overshadowed is the Knight Preceptor. Again, one of the slightly cheaper ones at 430 points. And again, it just kind of feels like probably the Questorius pattern that I'd be least likely to want to take. Most of the rest just being massively flat better by the main gun and the special rules. The Laz Impulsor will be okay at chipping off a bit of damage off most things. It is a bit swingy though with D6 shots on its main anti-tank profile. Most of the time, I think I'd want just about any of the other main Questorius weapons as a preference. Its bondsman ability gives you leadership and objective control, which isn't exactly ideal. And then its own unique special rule is allowing it to re-roll hit rolls against one nominated unit in the enemy army. Definitely not useless and could help out there, but it kind of banks on your opponent having a big threat in the army and it being close enough for the preceptor to get its Laz Impulsor into. Against a lot of armies that want to play a bit more guerrilla warfare style with multiple small units, it's kind of awful. Again, just with sheer competition, if you want a Preceptor type knight, then Canis Rex is just enormously better, both in combat and with a Laz Impulsor shooting at least, and I feel like you'd rarely take this guy when Canis Rex exists. Moving up into tier 3 though, where I feel like these are all a lot more playable, though probably a bit more niche and overshadowed, here I've chosen to rank the Errant, Porphyrion, Asterius, Sevastus Atropos, and the Forgewell Questor variants, which I probably would have ranked towards the bottom of this tier. The Knight Errand again is one of the cheaper ones at 430 points, I'd say it falls into the area of being just about okay, but again probably rarely going to be the pick that most people go for. This guy's main weapon is the Thermal Cannon, essentially 2d3 shots at the Armager Warglaive Thermal Spear type profile, but you get a massive Melter 6 if you can get within 12 inch range. It's definitely not too bad an anti-tank weapon, and you also get plus 1 to hit at the closest unit, I feel like between both of those though, it's really a massive reward for actually being able to get the biggest and nastiest stuff in the enemy army within that range, and if you're not able to. Its bonds and ability does help a bit with it, it means that if you use this, then both this guy and his bonded armager can re-roll advanced rolls, and all the weapons become assault weapons. Definitely not too bad for delivering range shooting, but even then I feel like the swing is just really quite a big deal, and 12 inches isn't impossible to screen out most of the time if it matters that much. Overall, I'd say it's definitely playable, I'd probably rank it towards the higher end of tier 3, though it's maybe just a bit more mediocre than a few of the other Questorus, having a weapon that's a bit stronger at range for the most part, and also better special rules. Next up, we've got the big Acastus Knights, the Porphyrion for 745 points, with the great big Magna Las Cannons, and the Asterius for 840 points, with the even bigger and nastier huge conversion beamers. These ones are basically rang as the knights that you bring if everyone else is bringing knights. Really quite big and tanky profiles that aren't going to go down too easily with an enormous toughness 13, 2 plus save and 30 wounds. And then profiles that are just so devastating in terms of anti-tank damage that they give you a serious chance of just one-shotting some in like an enemy Questorist knight, particularly the Grav Cannons on the Asterius, though you do pay an extra 100 points privilege for so much more reliability. These guys are definitely very scary and always going to be a big challenge to take out, though I feel like they just run the risk of not being able to do quite enough for their enormous points cost, which is going to take up over one third of your army in 2000 points. Unless the enemy has multiple huge threats that they can destroy fairly reliably, they're probably going to struggle to justify that. After the two, I think I'd still probably go with the Porphyrion, seeing as it's 100 points less, just going to be a little bit less dominant over the rest of the list, though I feel like the Asterius is solidly more dangerous for the extra cost. Next up, and maybe in a slightly similar theme, we've got the Serastus Knight Atropos. This one's 440 points, and again, I've put this in the area of Knight Killing Knights. Its damage profiles are okay generalists that will usually threaten just about most things, but maybe a bit less so than some of the other variants. Its special rules are getting a plus one to hit against vehicles or monsters, and then multiple big buffs against Titanic units, including its Bondsman ability making it go from kind of run-of-the-mill to genuinely very scary if you need to put down enemy super heavies. Overall, for that reason, I'd just rate it as a bit meta and match-up dependent. Could be worth it if your tournament scene locally is overrun by vehicles or big stompy enemy knights. Finally, for the Tier 3 knights, I've also chosen to rank the Forge World Knight Questor Magera and the Questor Styrix here. Now you're being a little bit generous to these guys, I feel like their rules are really quite underwhelming this edition compared with previously. The main issue is that both of them, either the Lightning Cannon or the Volkite, both get AP0, even if they do either kick out really quite a lot of hits or get some mortal wounds. I say despite that though, they maybe are supported by some better supporting rules than the things that are ranked down in Tier 4. They do have a Bondsman ability to ignore cover, which is very relevant in 10th edition. Could be handy to support Armager Helverins, for example, with their AP1. 
and they also do get the 5 plus invulnerable save, both in combat as well as at range as well, and that's really quite a big advantage. Otherwise, the Styrix can potentially slow units and has the grab secondary weapon, plus the Megira is a bit more tanky than most with its auto repair type ability. I feel like their main gun is kind of underwhelming in both cases, but they still pack the punch for Questorus Knight and have a lot better supporting rules than some. Moving onwards and upwards though, these are the knights that I'd rate as solidly usable, could certainly be used in competitive army lists, but maybe a little bit less common than the stuff that we'll talk about in Tier 1. First up we've got one that I was kind of on the fence about with the Knight Lancer, could have been a Tier 1 pick for me, kind of close. Its biggest downsize is that it is a fairly expensive knight, almost 500 points, and the vast vast majority of its damage is purely melee. Those are both really quite disadvantages together in Warhammer 40k, as it literally needs to basically be charging something just about every turn, and there's a good chance your opponent might be able to screen it out from the most important things, have it clatter against some chaff units, and then maybe get hit back hard. It does have some really big advantages for that role though, it essentially has a weapon skill 2 plus Thunderstrike Gauntlet with 5 attacks and a plus 1 to wound on the charge as well, which is kind of massive, and it combines that with free tank shock as well, just to get usually 6 mortal wounds on whatever your target. Its big shield gives it a 4 plus invulnerable save both at range and melee as well, that's really massive with the Sarastas chassis with the 24 wounds. It is very tanky and hard to take out with high AP weapons, particularly in combat. And then it has a particularly good bondsman ability as well, allowing you to advance and charge with it in a bondsman. And that's just enormous for just catapulting this across the table. A pretty reasonable chance for turn 1 charges here. It even does come with at least a little bit of close range shooting from that shock lance. Could do a little bit of damage to light infantry or something. Overall I feel like it's in a pretty good place to be honest. Still there's enough rules even if you do pay a premium for them. Definitely feels like a distraction Carnifex Knight that your opponent just really can't ignore and will probably have to try and focus a lot of their damage on despite the 4 plus invulnerable save. Next up we've got the Knight Valiant at 565 points. This one's one of the Dominus class ones with toughness 13 which is quite nice against the common strength 12 weapons and also a 2 plus armor save as well. This one gets the enormously hilarious Thundercoil Harpoon with a chance to smash out a whole load of devastating wounds against vehicles. A pretty brutal chance to kill a battle tank in a single shot there. And it backs that up with the Conflagration Cannon, allowing you 3d6 of those Strength 8, AP1 and Damage 2 shots. Perhaps a bit more serious and Overwatch threat compared with the Acheron, particularly when it's backed up by a whole load of secondary weapons that you might get a few 6s with as well. Overall between all that it's really quite an intimidating thing just to have stomping up onto midfield objectives. Light infantry might be a bit wary about going anywhere near it in the face of just getting half their squad blown away with overwatch, and bigger vehicles might want to stay away from that harpoon as well, so maybe quite a nice area denial type thing. It can also help out armagers with a bit of extra cover if they advance alongside it, though in 10th edition it's maybe not the hardest just to get cover saves for things anyway. As for downsides, probably the main thing is, is that it is kind of short range, just 18 inches, and really very pricey at 565 points. Perhaps just feels a little bit predictable to stomp up towards midfield objectives and try and have your opponent do something clever to get rid of it, or potentially just back away from it and focus on the rest of the other knights that are a bit easier to kill, and outrange this for a couple of turns so it can't really do much with those 18 inch guns. Still overall very playable I think though. Otherwise the knight Castellan's also 565 points. This one is the more ranged variant of the Dominus, the enormous plasma gun that's going to be pretty excellent at killing standard space marines or terminators, plus a great big volcano cannon for threatening to end enemy tanks or knights lives from across the map. As the Castellan it's also got some built in rerolls against vehicles as well which helps out a bit, particularly with these enormous shots. Overall for the cost I feel like this one's just kind of fine and well balanced for the points right now, fairly solid value and firepower, maybe just a little bit less standout than some of the rest. Perhaps kind of similar to the Acastus type knights, again it's one of the knights that in some matches might just struggle to really kill enough points to make up for its big points cost, particularly if the enemies don't have any enormous threats to end with that volcano lance. In general if you want a gun turret knight then the crusader does seem a bit popular at the moment, it is solidly cheaper and again has some very interesting guns. Next up is the knight paladin who again I think is pretty strong for the points cost. 450 points for a standard Questorus melee weapon plus a rapid fire battle cannon. The Paladin just seems like a pretty good all rounder with buffs that both help it out at range and in combat. The rapid fire battle cannon packs a whole load of shots if you get within 36 inch range, it gets lethal hits from the bondsman ability and an extra reroll over and above the regular nightly rerolls. In combat it has its bondsman ability to give itself lethal hits and lance as well, plus 2 one friendly armager. 
And again, that extra single reroll could be kind of big if you're attacking with something like a Reaper Chainsword or a Thunderstrike Gauntlet. Overall, I do think it's strong for the cost. Its main competitor is perhaps the Warden for a mixed roll knight with its minus one damage. In general, I feel like the Warden tends to get played a bit more competitively, but the Paladin's by no means bad, I think. Next up is the Serastus Knight Castigator, which I think is really quite well balanced with the top knights, to be honest. I feel again this could probably have either been a low tier 1 1 or high tier 2 1. Again, this one's probably best to compare with the Warden with the Avenger Gatling Cannon, as it's got a similar sort of profile but just with very different buffs and a bit more focused on damage dealing as opposed to defence. The dual Gatling Cannon of the Castigator really is quite monstrous though. You get the 18 shots at strength 6, AP 2, and damage 2. That's already very good and absolutely murders Space Marines, but the Castigator version can get sustained hits 1 with its Bondsman ability, AP minus 3 with the same. And it's also twin linked as well, so it's far, far more threatening to, say, toughness 10 and 11 vehicles than the regular one is. It also gives the sustained hits and extra AP to a bonded armager as well. I'd say that's a particularly interesting one to have for the Helverin, and could be kind of good for the Moirax as well. Then has some standard pattern Questorus melee, and gives the enemy a minus one to hit debuff by whatever was shot by that Gatling cannon, presuming there's anything left. In general, I've not seen these played competitively quite as much as things like the Warden and Crusader, though I do think it's probably kind of balanced with them. I definitely could have very happily ranked this one as a tier 1 or high tier 2. Next up, we've got the Armager Moirax for 170 points. This one's perhaps a bit of a side grade on the regular Armagers, though it does cost significantly more. The regular ones are either 140 or 145. This guy's all the way up at 170, so it does pay a big tax. I'd say for that reason, it's maybe a bit on the underwhelming side. Probably the biggest selling point in my opinion is the option for the melee being a strength 12 and damage d6 plus 2 claw. And that claw also gets a built in rad cleanser as well which is kind of added value. For the other weapon you've got a choice of different interesting guns. Most of them I think are okay. I probably prefer either the conversion beams, grav or lightning locks to the volkite. I think you could make arguments for any of them and they're not significantly stand out. I think I probably wouldn't run entire phalanxes of the Moirax. I maybe see it as a bit of an optional upgrade if you're running regular armagers and you had some points left over that you needed to use up. Maybe it could be interesting just to have a pretty devastating anti-vehicle knight to counter charge with. Could be a reasonable enough alternative to a warglaive, or if you just needed some dedicated anti-horde you could pick up some lightning locks or something. Finally for 400 points we've got the knight gallant. I feel like I would have rated this guy a bit lower before the towering model's points increase. But now everything went up by a fairly significant margin, the Gallant is the single cheapest big knight, and kind of feels like he's going for the exact same thing as the Lancer, but a bit more of a cut price version of that. You're paying 100 points less, still getting around about the same sheer amount of melee carnage that the Lancer can bring, but it's a bit slower and a bit easier to kill. He does have maybe a little bit more meaningful shooting with the Storm Spear Rocket Pod on top for a bunch of mid-strength damage D6 attacks, but mainly it's all about the melee once more, getting 6 attacks with his choice of the different knightly profiles, which is quite powerful to be able to select just the right thing for the job. Plus a re-roll hits in combat bondsman ability, and he's a little bit safer in melee than he might otherwise be with a minus 1 to hit. I'd say that overall, probably the upgrade to the Lancer if you're wanting a dedicated melee knight is probably worth it for the extra cost. I think in particular the lack of speed that he has and the fact that he might have a turn or two outside of combat really isn't ideal. I feel like for costing so much less he's probably not significantly far behind and in some games could cause a whole load of carnage and soak up a bunch of fire away from all the other knights. I'd probably put towards the lower end of tier 2. Finally for the upper end of the knightly households we come to tier 1. These are the knights that I currently rate the strongest in Warhammer 40k and probably the data sheets that are most likely to be cropping up in competitive lists. First up for 480 points we've got the Warden. This one's the Avenger Gatling Cannon Knight with that brutal 18 shot profile, strength 6, AP 2 and damage 2. The Warden's version also gets devastating wounds against anything that isn't a monster and vehicle as well. That's really quite big against some elite infantry targets. I'd say perhaps the single biggest selling point for the Warden though is its Bonds mobility which gives you a massive toughness increase. You get minus 1 damage both for the Warden itself and also for one other knight that you're buffing. So maybe an expendable Armager Warglaive that you want to push onto objectives. This one really is a seriously tanky heart to a knight battle line. There's just a whole load of barriers to damage between the invulnerable saves at range, the 6 plus feel no pain, or maybe 5 plus if you're honoured, and then also minus 1 damage as well. You can very easily have a lot of enemy attacks just completely go nowhere. I think for knights as well, a lot of the time, just having more toughness can be more important than having more damage. Unlike a lot of armies in Warhammer 40k, if you've got an entire Imperial Knights army on the board, you're probably not going to be able to hide all of them behind terrain, 
some things are going to be taking damage. And with the Warden supporting some armages, you can hopefully make sure that those things are significantly harder to kill than other things in your list. Overall, I would race as one of the most competitive knights. It also chips in with some Storm Spear rockets, a heavy flamer on the Gatling cannon, plus the standard issue Questorus melee as well. So really quite a strong all-rounder in the centre of your army, I think. Next up, we've got the fearsome gun turret that is the Knight Crusader. 475 points, and perhaps one of the knights that makes the best use of the towering rules just to obliterate a whole load of enemies off the table. Kind of crazy to think that this guy was around about the 400 point mark before. He's definitely still very effective at this cost. He's got an Avenger Gatling Cannon, and I feel like it's most common to see that paired with the Rapid Fire Battle Cannon, with a whole bunch of spammed Strength 3 hits, even if the AP isn't great. You could take the Thermal Cannon if you prefer a little bit more of an AP anti-tank focus. You also get a Storm Spear Pod and often a couple of Stubbers as well if you have the Rapid Fire Battle Cannon. And then all of these guns get to be very reliable indeed. It gives itself plus one to hit and also the same to an Armager. You could be supporting a Helverin or maybe even more than that if you give it one of the enhancements. Overall just can spam out an enormous amount of mid-damage shots with mid-AP. She'll be able to blast a whole load of enemy infantry units off the board and definitely isn't bad against tanks and vehicles. Should stack enough saves that you get some damage through. It's perhaps quite a nice one to use that plus one to wound stratagem on for an excessive turn of damage dealing. Also if you can have a turn when you can just afford to stand still and just open up with maximal firepower, you also even get sustained hits as well on all of those guns. Another very very nice boost there, though I'd say often it's just going to be more valuable to be moving around anyway and getting line of sight on what you need to. Again I'd certainly rate it as one of the very most competitive big knights around. Next up are the Armager Warglaives, really quite efficient and scary frontline units for the knights. More expendable than the big knights and great for zipping around to objectives which they can take with fairly high objective control values of 8. They're pretty much exactly what you want on the front line. Having a great big anti-tank weapon with 2 shots and melter 4 if you can get close. If you roll well with one of those you can certainly destroy an entire enemy tank in one shot if you get lucky. And they really quite like the single re-rolls that knights get. Being able to try again with any ones that you get are kind of nice. The melee is also solidly general purpose, having both an anti-armor and an anti-horde mode, so quite good flexibility there. You could tank shock with them if you needed to tip the balance in a close combat, and they also get sustained hits on the charge as well, which helps out a little bit. For the top weapons, I'd choose the heavy stubber. Really quite nice to get 6 shots at AP-1 at close range. Definitely again helps them thin out hordes of infantry, and I think it's more valuable than the melter gun. Overall very good, it's rare to see an Imperial Knight's army not running say at least three of these guys, and they are also kind of necessary for a whole bunch of Bondsman abilities. They pretty much get on pretty well with most of them, they're like minus one damage from the Warden, or the Paladin's Lance things, the Errant's Advance and Shoot, or the Lance's Advance and Charge. The Crusader definitely isn't wasted on them either, making those Thermal Spears hit on a 2 plus is still very scary. Next up we've got the Freeblade Powerhouse that is Canis Rex himself, 490 points and the stats of a Preceptor but without any sort of top gun, but in terms of its melee damage and Laz Impulsor you're getting around about a 75% damage increase for just around about 60 points as an upgrade, seems more than worth it to me. The reason for that damage increase is that it hits on a 2+, plus rather than a 3+, plus, which is big, and then also gets sustained hits on a 5+, plus as well. So most of the time you actually average slightly more hits than you have shots, which is kind of crazy. While the Laz Impulsor maybe isn't my favourite weapon out of the Big Knight ones, I feel like with those monstrous buffs it's enough to get it over the top and become truly threatening. The advantages don't end there though, it also gets extra damage at damage 9 for Freedom's Hand and gets 5 attacks like the Lancer. Certainly with the sustained hits on its melee as well, it's got similar sort of combat levels to the Gallant and the Lancer, which is pretty massive. He gets a free stratagem for 0 CP each turn, means that you could always be rotating ion shields or get free tank shock or something. It's a particularly powerful option for the knights when you get to apply those expensive free stratagems to something this big. And then eventually if he does die, then Sir Hector will get out when he dies. We'll give you one extra model that could be a nuisance factor for holding objectives, or just screening the board and making enemies have to move to try and deal with him if they want to be able to drop their units or something. Overall between all that he just brings a whole load of raw might. He doesn't have a bondsman ability to help out armages or anything, though for some armies that could be a positive. He's perhaps one of the single best knights to use as an allied knight to other imperial factions to add more strength. Overall I feel like it's just very easy to use, solid enough shooting and absolutely enormous melee, plus free stratagems and Sir Hector. 
Finally for this tier we've got the Armager Helverins, which I might rate just a tiny bit below some of the rest. Though again I feel like they're a unit that most competitive knight lists will run. Maybe just to have one or two of them hovering around the midfield to help secure home field objectives. And to use certain bondsman abilities like the Crusaders one maybe. These guys function pretty similarly to how they did last time round. 8 shots worth of auto cannon fire with strength 9, AP 1 and damage 3. A good generalist profile that can definitely worry anything from light infantry to vehicles. Probably the weakest part of them being that they've only got AP minus 1. So anything with a 2 plus save and particularly if it gets cover is going to give them a big pause. They've got good range though and good mobility. And it means that they can often just be chipping in with that profile for the majority of the game. Probably not usually being the single most high priority threat if the enemy's got armager war glaives and big knights rushing at them. I think they're quite a nice choice for the Squire's Duty Focus Fire Stratagem. That gives them all an extra pip of strength and AP against their chosen target. Strength 10 and AP minus 2 is far more threatening against medium vehicles. And if you do happen to have enemy units that have got the fly keyword and high toughness, they can be absolutely brutal against them. They get anti-fly 2 plus if they're either in their own deployment zone or on an objective. And that's just incredibly nice for anything that they need to wound on a 5+. plus. Perhaps things like Custodes Caladius tanks, Necron monoliths or Tower Hammerheads or something. Again, they're an armager with all sorts of great options for the Bondsman abilities. They're like the Crusaders plus 1 to hit, the Paladins lethal hits, and the Wardens minus 1 damage. And in particular, I think they get on well with the Castigators, extra AP and the sustained hits. That seems one of the best for them. Overall, I'd say they're probably not quite as standout as Warglaives point for point. I probably wouldn't be tempted to spam quite as many of them compared with the Warglaives, but I still think that it's very nice to have maybe somewhere between 1 and 3 of them to help out with backfield objectives, and their damage profile is very nice for chipping in with solid wounds against certain units. Overall, with Tier 1 talked about, that brings to a close my review of the Imperial Knights. Let me know which ones have been working out well for you in-game, and which particular noble paragons and warsuits you're having to stride towards your enemy at the moment. Definitely happy to hear some alternative takes as well, I do feel that with the Lancer and the Castigator, maybe Tier 1 might have been a bit more appropriate for them. They're perhaps the ones that are most on the fence about. As mentioned as well, if you would like to enter into that Knight Household giveaway, then the links are down in the video description. Either support on Patreon, or check back for the Facebook post on the 1st of September. Hopefully it should mean that there's a few more people out there with some Knight Households to charge at the enemy with. Otherwise, feel free to subscribe to All Specs Tactics if you'd like to see more like this. And if you'd like to help out the channel on Patreon, then there are a few other advantages as well. You get to see certain videos early, regular votes to see what sort of things come next on the channel, and automatic entry into the regular prize giveaways with a chance to win some big model kits each month. If any of that sounds good to you, or you'd just like to help support, the link is down in the video description. In any case, an enormous thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.